Greetings, friends. Here we are. Another <laughs> Nathan, I'm so excited. Uh, you know, as I look around, dang. Uh, Netherlands, Germany, Russia, Japan. You guys are incredible. You're in for a real treat today. That's probably why you're all here. <laughs> Nathan Patton, it's going to be incredible. Um, I'm going to uh, dispense with any preamble. You know, <laughs> normally it's like, okay, David, be quiet, be quiet. give the speaker some time. But I just got a sneak preview, and I know that um, Patton Sensei is going to do this call a little bit differently, which I love. He's going to try to engage us a little bit more directly. And I'm really looking forward to that because he is a master teacher, I can tell you. And uh, let me go ahead and just introduce uh, our presenter, uh, Nathan Patton. By the way, Nathan, I love the tie. It, it is nice. Thanks, Sensei. <laughs> at, at, least, at least somebody's raising the level of you know, <laughs> professionalism, you know. <clears throat> I was gonna say something about your hair and my hair, and now, no, 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 no. I can always lower the level. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay, anyway. Um, okay, so Nathan Patton, he is uh, first, what I always do, set up his Aikido experience. He is a Yondan, fourth degree uh, black belt, um, and in Shinshin Totsu Aikido. And in Shinshin Totsu Do, he is Chu Den. And he is also a full lecturer with the International uh, Key Society. I'm going to go all the way back. Uh, he was born in Jackson, Mississippi in 1983, uh, moved to Marietta, Georgia with his family for a few short years. And this is really interesting, folks. When he was four years old, he moved with his family to Japan, where he lived for the next 10 years. So Nathan pretty much grew up in Japan, uh, going to Japanese school. And um, I think he told me once the reason why it was only 10 years is I think his parents wanted to make, be sure that you started high school, maybe back here. So anyway, he moved to, the family moved to Orlando, Florida, where he went to four years of high school. And then he went to Furman University. Imagine that, from 2001 to 2005. Um, after he graduated from Furman, he was like, this is really prestigious, folks, but he taught for, um, Teach for America. And it's really hard to, to do that. Um, and it's because he's like a super all star in everything that he does. At Furman, it seemed like he was training full time, but he was also in theater and performing in plays and things. I remember one play, they needed a stunt man, someone that was going to do a break fall off a table onto a hardwood floor. And of course, he had to do it like, the whole show, all the rehearsals. Later in life, he had this back problem and he, he swore it was me, like too, too much ukemi in my fighting mind days. <laughs> and, uh, but I think, I think it was the hardwood floor in the theater. Anyway, um, he, went to, he went to Teach for America and where did he go? Harlem, uh, IS, I-95 in Harlem in New York City, where he taught for two years and at the same time received a master's degree in teaching from Pace University in New York. Uh, in those early years, get this, he was a finalist for a National Sue Lehman Award for Excellence in Teaching. So right off the bat, he was distinguishing himself. I can tell you that for a fact. Then starting in 2005 to 2011, for the next six years, he continued to teach in Harlem, Newark, and New Rochelle. And I had the pleasure of actually going and visiting one of those schools and doing a Ki Aikido demonstration where he was starting a club. That was a team academy, Nathan. Um, and then from there, from 2011 to present, he's been at People's Prep Charter School in Newark, New Jersey. And he's been the director of curriculum and instruction. And if I could, just to give a sense of his responsibilities, he helped start the school in its first year and was responsible for developing and aligning all of the curriculum and virtually all the grades for all subjects. He was responsible for hiring the teachers, training them, and continually developing their craft through coaching and professional development. 
Uh, he also trained and managed the instructional leadership team, which was a key group of a dozen teachers who support the continual improvement uh, in their academic programs. Um, approximately 30% of the student, incoming students have disabilities and more than 90% are eligible for free or reduced priced lunch. The mission at People's Prep is to prepare the students to graduate from college of their choice and to start st starting um, high school with many grade levels behind still, and get this, because this is astronomical, 94% graduate from high school and 90% are accepted to college and 95% of them will be first generation college students. Um, I can tell you that Nathan and, and the team up there um, are, is just phenomenal. I'm gonna say a couple more words about that. But I wanted to say, you know, he's so good, he sought after. And I just thought all of us who study Ki Aikido and, and, and whatnot, I think those of you who know Nathan, but even if you don't and you know Ki Aikido, these are examples of just titles of the kinds of seminars that he gives on a consulting basis to educators. Um, how about this one? The Growth Mindset, Socratic Seminars, Data-Driven Instruction, Teaching and Assessing Student Writing, Teaching with Love and Logic, Constructivism in the Classroom. Hey, I just saw you, Toby. You're going to love this because Toby Vogels, Chief Instructor of Europe, he is a professional teacher as well. Right, Toby? Yeah, okay. Uh, code switching, cultural awareness and sensitivity, managing groups work, and I love this one, the treasure of error. So I want to say also, Nathan is married to Karen, his better half, who also went to Furman who is a PhD in school psychology, who specializes in testing and counseling and students with disabilities. Uh, they have two beautiful children, Hank and Charlotte. And I wanted to say on a personal note, um, in 2004, he went with us and competed in the International Taigi competition. And of in interesting as his partner was uh, Charles Boyer Sensei, who also started his Aikido at Furman. Uh, and that was pretty cool because they were training together but separately for this and they did very well. Um, and then uh, Nathan returned again the following year to attend a world camp and both times like Matthew Atarian there in Japan right now, uh, I'm happy to say that Furman was able to support all of that um, uh, training in Japan for, for this, the, the Furman Ki Aikido Club. Um, I wanted to mention one other thing, People's Prep, the school that he's just leaving. Um, there's a bunch of EKF people <clears throat> that I really respect who are all a part of this. Adam Goldfarb, I usually, up oh, there you are, Adam. Um, <clears throat> Adam was uh, the, the board chair and was influential in helping to start this school. Uh, many of you know Keith Robinson, his, uh, who is the principal of the school, who comes and trains with us um, at seminars. You, you'll see uh, Keith. Um, it was a pleasure to do seminars there at People's Prep where they had a program and, and they actually brought uh, twice to EKF summer camps. They chartered a bus and brought uh, students from the school from their Aikido program to our summer camp. And finally, last summer, I had the privilege of having um, Pat and Sensei accompany me to Russia where he served as Otomo. And he specialized in rock climbing, wall climbing in St. Petersburg, and taking care of me when I got food poisoning <laughs> just, before the, just before the seminar started. Um, right now, I'm looking forward to hopefully the beginning of Alabama Ki Aikido with a new head instructor, Nathan Patton, uh, because he's moved to Birmingham where his um, uh, family lives. So they're moving uh, back to the South and he's now the director of teaching and learning at a new um, uh, uh, school called Legacy Prep in Birmingham. And so uh, he's essentially the director of the school and um, he's starting school in rather interesting times, wouldn't we all agree? Um, that said, um, I'm, I'm eager to give as much time as possible to Nathan Patton, who's just a gem, and I'll turn my microphone off, Nathan. 
Sensei, thank you so much for those kind words. That's, that's very nice of you. Um, okay, let me share my screen. Uh, so hello everyone. I am uh, so honored for the opportunity to speak to you all today. I, as uh, Sensei mentioned, I'm coming to you from uh, Birmingham, Alabama, from uh, my parents' guest bedroom. <laughs> Um, and before I get started, I want to thank uh, several people. Uh, first of all, I want to thank Laurel from Minnesota uh, for being a thought partner in planning this. Um, I want to thank Adam for watching me practice and giving me feedback. Um, I want to thank Freiling Sensei for teaching me so much about this topic. And of course, uh, Shainer Sensei, who uh, was of course the first person I talked to about this session. Uh, and thank you to all of you who are tuning in today. I'm grateful. Uh, so I want to start uh, with a prompt to frame this session and to get us all thinking. Um, so please grab a notebook or paper uh, that you can use to jot down your thoughts. Um, you, could, you could type, uh, but I am going to be asking us to stop and jot several times throughout this session. Okay, so for this first one, this is, this is going to be our first prompt. Um, pretend that the title of this session, which is we're one, but we're not the same. Pretend that it's not a lyric from an early 90s pop song, which of course it is. Any U2 fans out there? Hopefully, uh, hopefully Bono won't sue me for uh, using this in this way. Um, but instead pretend uh, that it is a koan in the Zen tradition. Okay. Now I want you to reflect on it for about 45 seconds. And you might ask yourself questions like, how do you interpret it? Uh, what about it feels true, what doesn't, and how does it make you feel? Okay, so I'm gonna give you 45 seconds. Please begin. Twenty more seconds. Okay, thank you so much for that thinking. I'm hoping that that will uh, prime the pumps for uh, this topic that we're going to explore today. And we'll come back to that koan in just a moment, but first let's take a look at our agenda. Um, so first I want to talk to you about how this topic came to mind as something I'd like to talk to you all about today. Uh, after that we'll go back to the koan and we'll explore it. And first I'll focus in on the first half of it uh, and on Tohei Sensei's teachings about the oneness of the universe. Uh, and then we'll look at the second half in isolation and talk about what that means, and I'll, I'll, I'll use the idea of Zenshin uh, as a way to try to explore that. And then we'll put those two halves back together and consider it as a whole again, and I'll talk to you about how this seeming contradiction has led me in the past to what I now think is a false conclusion uh, about connection and separation. And then that will lead us uh, to the idea of knowing our partner's mind uh, and what that means on the mat, what it means in daily life, and then how humility is key to that understanding, to understanding our partner's mind. Um, then I'll share some things that I have learned that have humbled me, uh, humiliated me in some cases. Uh, and these are, these are kigatsuku that I've had that have come out of mistakes that I've made. I'll share uh, three examples. One, uh, an example about language, another one about staying up late, uh, and a third about bare feet. Then I'm going to give you all an opportunity to uh, reflect a little bit uh, and to uh, think about how this could be applied uh, in your daily life. Uh, and then finally, I'm going to put a link into the chat that will take you to a survey that will allow you to share your thoughts about all of this with me anonymously. Um, so as you're listening, you know, write down anything that comes to your mind that you may want to include in your response at the end. Okay. So here's how this topic came to mind. Um, two weeks ago, Shander Sensei showed us uh, what it can look like to apply Aikido principles to policing, uh, which is, of course, a very 
timely topic as our nation is in the midst of this movement for anti-racism uh, and as black Americans and, and their allies are continuing to fight for equity. Uh, and Chandra, since I mentioned that many of his students had requested that he talk about his experiences in the field of policing uh, at this moment. His talk led me to think about some of the objections that I have heard to the movement that's going on right now. And some of those objections or disagreements with the principles of the movement, they, they seem to me now to have something in common. Um, and it, it seems to be a disagreement about the nature of people's connection to one another or separation from one another. Uh, about the, the nature of sameness or difference between people. And it seemed to me that, some, that our training really could have something to say about this. It could speak to an important aspect of this uh, disagreement. And to, to grossly oversimplify, the, the objection or the disagreement that I hear sounds something like a person saying, well, I want racism to end too, but all of this focus on race just serves to increase division between white and black Americans, when what we should be doing now more than ever is focusing on our common humanity. So again, I think that our training to, can speak to that idea and that's what I wanna explore today. So that means that I'm gonna be charging into territory that can be controversial um, or even you know, if you agree with what I'm saying, it could still make some people uncomfortable. Um, Friendling since they have I have I lost anyone yet? Or have people signed out of this uh, Zoom already? Okay, just just kidding. Uh, but I just I just want to ask that you all keep in mind the way that sometimes doing things that feel uncomfortable can lead to growth, right? Just like on the mat. Um, and you know, please extend key to me and extend grace to me as I take some risks here. Um, and keep in mind that. It's possible that this could be a valuable experience for you, even if you disagree with every word that I say. Uh, and if you do disagree with every word that I say, you'll you know, remember that you'll be able to tell me that uh, through the survey form at the end, and I would be very excited to, to read your thoughts and your reactions. Um, okay, so let's go back to the koan, our, our U2 koan that you reflected on earlier. Uh, and let's focus on the first half, we're one. We'll come back to the second half in a moment. Um, so we're one, that's about connection, right? It's, it's the philosophical monism that Shainer Sensei mentioned a couple weeks ago. Oneness, connection. And of course, this oneness and connection is one of the key pillars of Tohei Sensei's teachings. Uh, our motto says that to become one, one with the universe is the ultimate purpose of our study. Uh, the oneness of the universe also comes up in Shokshu's number three and four, five, eight, 10, 11, 15, 17, 18, 19, I checked. Um, and, and one that uh, stands out to me is Shokshu number 15 on, on key breathing, right? It memorably says that the feeling that you are the universe and the universe is you leads you to the supreme ecstasy of being one with the universe. And, you know, Shainer Sensei often talks about how interdependent we are, right? He's saying things like, if you're not interconnected, you're dead. Um, and and uh, by the way, um, one of the core values of the new school that I work at now uh, is love. And uh, one of the ways that they define that core value is with the idea, I'm not my sister's keeper, I am my sister. Same idea, right? So this idea of oneness and connection is, is very familiar to us. Now, <clears throat> I'm not trying to oversimplify it. It's a big, complex idea that I manage to forget all of the time. And I feel like I understand it, you know, a little bit more deeply every year, but so, so I'm, not, I'm not trying to, you know, again, oversimplify it, but I think it is an idea that is familiar to us. Okay, so that's the first half of the koan. Let's, let's shift over to the second half now. We're not the same. So Sensei also teaches us that the universe is not static, right? It's in constant flux. And so not only are each of us different from one another, but in a meaningful sense, I'm not even the same me as I was when I started speaking to you almost 10 minutes ago, right? Um, each of us is as different as uh, Shainer Sensei said to me the other day, as a lion is from a peacock. So let's think about um, the second of our four basic principles, relax completely. Uh, relax completely is the English translation of zenshin no chikaro kanzen ni nuku. And I'm not actually, 
going to be talking about relax completely so much as I want to zoom in on that word zenshin. Um, so literally, and, and maybe perhaps a little bit superficially, zenshin no chikara means the strength of your whole body. Uh, but since it teaches us to think about it as the power of your whole self, right, it, which would include your ego, your hopes and dreams, your past lives, as Sensei says, anything that could make you who you are would be a part of your Zenshin. So if we think about Zenshin in that way, it just underscores how immeasurably complex and variegated each of us are. Um, remember the, uh, the iceberg metaphor, right? Shokshu 4 um, about the unification of mind and body says, the power you ordinarily use is like the small visible segment of an iceberg. Well, perhaps the same could be said of our Zenshin, right? Like the obvious visible parts of ourselves are like the exposed parts of the iceberg, but perhaps the vast majority of our Zenshin might be hidden from others' view. So let's, let's continue to explore uh, different aspects of our Zenshin for a moment. So I'm gonna ask you to type into the chat some phenomena that contribute to you being who you are. And I'll, I'll begin with an example here. Okay. Okay, I just typed birth order. I'm the oldest of four kids in my family, and I'm sure that that shaped me in all kinds of ways that I may never fully understand, right? Okay, so, so now do the same thing, please. T spend 30 seconds loading up the chat with different components of your Zenshin. Great. Mm-hmm. Exactly. Yeah, great. <laughs> yeah. Uh-huh. Wow. Yeah, those are great. Those are great examples. Thank you. Um, so it's, it's as if we're made up of these accumulations of experiences, right? Of, of generations of shared knowledge or epigenetic influences, diet, education, just a whole bunch of things, right? And when I think about how immensely complex my Zenshin is, it's enough to make me wonder if, if my free will or what I perceive to be my free will is actually just an illusion. If every choice I make is just exactly the choice that I would make given my particular Zenshin, like that was the only choice I could have made in that exact moment uh, given my exact background. But whether that's true or not, it's a humbling thought, right? My grandmother used to express a similar kind of idea with the phrase, there but for the grace of God go I. Give me a nod if that's a, phrase, a sentence you've heard before. Is that familiar to you? Okay. So this might be apocryphal, but it, uh, allegedly um, John Bradford said that in the 16th century, watching some prisoners being escorted to their own execution. And so the idea is that we're different and we're not in control of all of the things that make us different. Okay, so now let's put the two halves of our koan back together. So on the one hand, we're all one, but at the same time, we're as different as can be. Well, how can both of these things be true? The fact that these two ideas seem so contradictory has led me in the past to draw the following conclusion. If I notice the ways in which I'm different from another person, I will be increasing the separation between the two of us. I'll say that one more time. Uh, if I notice the ways in which I'm different from another person, I will be increasing the separation between the two of us. I have come to believe that that is a false conclusion and that actually the opposite can be true. That it's counterintuitive, but that noticing the differences between us can forge greater connection. Now, I wanna ask you, this is gonna be another moment to stop and jot. I wanna ask you, why would I make that claim how could I possibly think that that's true? Uh, take another 45 seconds to consider this claim. Go ahead.
15 more seconds. Okay, thank you so much. Thank you for that thinking. I, I wish I could hear your thoughts. Uh, you know, I wish that our, uh, you know, that the pandemic wasn't making it so that this can't really be a dialogue, but uh, perhaps we can discuss the, the next time I see you. Um, okay, so here's why I make that claim. To take the time to really scrutinize the differences between us requires that I believe that you are worthy of my attention. I have to care in order to learn about the specifics of your zenshin, especially about the invisible details of your zenshin, about the beneath the surface aspects of your zenshin, right? And when I care to learn about your zenshin, I'm communicating something to you. I'm communicating that you are important to me and that develops and strengthens connection. Learning something about you, especially if it's a characteristic that I don't share, requires an awareness and that means that I have to be extending key to you in order to perceive it. In his class uh, two weeks ago, Shainer Sensei uh, was talking about trust being a social good, right? And he, he talked about the fourth principle of Shin Shin Toitsu Aikido, uh, which is put yourself in the place of your partner. Well, let's remind ourselves about the first three principles that lead up to that one. Uh, so go ahead and type into the chat field the first of those principles. Exactly. Yeah, extend key. We're, we're picking up where we left off uh, from four basic principles, right? Okay, so what about the second one? Do you remember? There we go, know your partner's mind. Exactly right. Um, and then the third, what comes next? Respect your partner's key, exactly. Exactly. So it's only if I am extending key that I can know my partner's mind. And it's only if I know my partner's mind that I can respect my partner's key. And only if I respect my partner's key that I can put myself in my partner's place. And then lastly, of course, then I can perform or lead with confidence. Um, so, so let's think about what that looks like on the mat. Let's visualize the Kaisho version of Katate Kosodori Kokinage. So as Sensei teaches, it's a great illustration of the five principles of Shin Shinto Itzu Aikido, or the, or the five principles to lead others, right? First, we, we offer our hands to our partner, right, to demonstrate that key is extending, that's step one. And then we take a moment to recognize the direction of our partner's key, that's step two. And only then can we respect our partner's key and put ourselves in our partner's place. I learned in my first class that if I, as Nage, am not extending key to my partner, it's not safe to begin the technique. If, I give, if, if my partner, rather, gives me a key test by applying pressure to my wrist and I move backwards, then I'm not extending key. And if I'm not extending key, I can't perceive my partner's key. I can't know my partner's mind. And if I don't know my partner's mind, how could I hope to put myself in my partner's place? Of course, I won't be able to. How could I put myself in their place if I don't know where they are? Right? So if you're like me, you know what it feels like to make that mistake with Katate Kosodori Kokinage. To me, it feels like complete separation, like the uke is heavy, and like I'm trying to drag the uke around the room. Maybe, maybe, it's, maybe it's not just me, maybe somebody else can relate to that. But let's talk about what that looks like in daily life. So let me go ahead and stop sharing my screen here. Okay, so Shokshu 12 uh, in, on key development exercises, right, says that it's easier to keep one point when sitting or standing still than when in motion. Similarly, it's easier to know my partner's mind when I'm trying to do kaisho arts on the mat than when I'm trying to figure out why a student can't read yet, or when I'm coaching a teacher, or when I'm arguing with my wife, or when I'm debating someone about politics, or something like that, right? That kaisho example is such a helpful and instructive tool, but these key in daily life moments are so complicated and it's so hard to apply the principles. So what does it take? I think that it takes a radical level of humility. I think it requires me to treat everyone as if I'm their otomo. Think about how much attention you have to pay when you are engaged in otomo training. Think about the awareness that's required, right? How much you need to extend key to perceive sensei's needs, 
how much you need to be off me, as uh, Matt Dirchkitter says. Um, it's, if I were to sustain that humility in interacting with those around me, I would better understand what my partners are thinking and why they're thinking it and what they're doing and why they're doing it and what they're saying and why they're saying it. And I would know my, my partner's mind better. And there's another reason why I say that knowing my partner's mind requires radical humility. When my key slacks and I'm not paying people the attention that they deserve, my default is to assume that they're like me, that they think the same way I do and have the same experiences that I have had. So if putting yourself in the place of your partner is, as Shane Sensei says, an act of empathy, then knowing your partner's mind is an act of humility. And we'll have a hard time being properly empathetic if we aren't first being properly hum uh, humble, just like when I'm clumsily dragging the uke across the mat. So that raises, to me, that, that raises the, you know, the next question is just how do we cultivate that humility? I think that I need to intentionally open myself up to learning about the ways that someone else's zenshin would lead them to approach a situation differently than I would. So for example, if we go back to earlier when you typed into the chat uh, various phenomena that have contributed to your zenshin, which did you think of first? Did you think of characteristics that are more like people around you or less like people around you? For me, the first things that come to my mind are things that would put me into a minority group for that characteristic, like the fact that I have three younger sisters or the books that I've read or the teachers that I've had or the fact that I grew up overseas. They come to mind first and I think to myself, yeah, these are the things that make me who I am because they feel to me like differentiating factors. But really, they're only differentiating factors from the perspective of someone who's already very much like me. And it's only through like some degree of awareness and humility and intentionality that I, I then think of characteristics that put me in the majority group for my community. Like the fact that I look white or that I seem straight or that I sound like a native English speaker, right? Those things don't come to mind as immediately as aspects of my zenshin, but they play an outsized role in making me who I am. Another example is the fact that I'm married to Karen, right? And that no one else is married to Karen, as far as I know. Um, but that, that affects nearly every aspect of my existence, right? Like my day-to-day -day would be inconceivable, inconceivably different if I weren't married to her. And yet it's easy for me to forget how much that affects me because its influence is ever present. It's like, it, like, like the expression um, about not being able to see the forest for the trees. Another example is that I used to be keenly aware of my own race because when I was growing up in Japan, it felt it was very common for kids passing me on the street to point and stare and say, oh, gaijinda. And so, then my race felt like a defining characteristic of my zenshin. But you know, in this country where I'm in the racial majority, I experience the privilege of my race being a less salient detail about me, or that's the way it feels often. And it, now it takes an intentionality to be aware of the fact that I am white and that my whiteness impacts everything about me. So the fact that it can be easy to forget or to discount certain big important characteristics of our zenshin makes it especially difficult to know our partner's mind when our partner doesn't share those characteristics that we tend to forget. That sentence was a mouthful, but essentially all I'm doing is describing implicit bias using Aik Aikido language, right, from an Aikido lens. Um, quick aside, uh, you may have done this nine years ago when it first came out, but there's a, a research group called Project Implicit, uh, and it's in, involving researchers from universities all across the country. Uh, and they created this online tool for examining implicit bias. Uh, and I'll put the link into the chat right now. Okay, there it is. So if you go there, don't do it now, but if you go there, um, you first you'll you know, fill out a, a questionnaire that asks you some things about, about you and your beliefs. Uh, and then you can take a variety of tests uh, that attempt to measure your split second judgments uh, about different types of people. And it can be fun and it can be illuminating and it can be horrifying. Uh, and I recommend it if you uh, haven't tried it before. Uh, okay, so 
back to my biases. If I am to be radically humble, I have to realize that I might not see the world in the same way uh, if I were not white, uh, or if I were queer, or if I were a recent immigrant, uh, or if I were Muslim, uh, or if I had different political allegiances. And in order to know other people's minds, I must continually develop my awareness of people who who are different than I am. And I must extend key in directions that maybe I'm not used to extending key and towards people that I'm not used to extending key toward. Uh, and somehow I must be aware of which types of differences I'm least aware of. Uh, obviously that's a, a tough epistemological nut to crack. Um, but, you know, Shander Sensei writes in, in Living with the Wind at Your Back about the discipline of self-honesty. And he reminded me of this um, the other day when we were talking. And, you know, there's self-honesty 101 and self-honesty 202. And, and by the time we get to self-honesty 303, it's, it's about living a lifestyle of careful reflection. And I think that it takes that constant careful attention. And that, that's work. Um, and I'm sure that I will need to continue to do that work on myself for the rest of my life. Uh, okay, so now I want to transition to giving some examples of my own mistakes uh, and failures of humility and the kigatsuku that came out of those mistakes. Um, as I mentioned before, I'll, I'll discuss three of these, one about staying up late, uh, one about bare feet, and one about language. Okay, so once upon a time, <laughs> Uh, I lived in a neighborhood uh, where young kids were often out playing the street and on the sidewalks in a really lovely and adorable way. Um, it, was, uh, it was a beautiful neighborhood feeling, like something you would see in a movie. But I was surprised that uh, the kids would continue to play outside until what felt like late in the evening, like sometimes after nine o'clock. And I thought that that was just a real shame. Um, and it was easy for me to imagine how sleepy those kids are going to be in school tomorrow morning and how hard it's going to be for their teacher to get them to learn. And I just couldn't understand why their parents were failing to prioritize their kids' education. I was like, how, how could they not see how important it is to get them to bed and set them up for success in school the next day? Well, after a while, I came to learn that very few people in this particular neighborhood had air conditioners. Uh, or if they did, it would have been financially irresponsible for them to run them the way I did. Um, and it was, it was just too hot to fall asleep until later in the evening when the house cooled down. And when I learned that, I felt ashamed. I still feel ashamed of having assumed the worst about someone's intentions instead of assuming that I had incomplete information. And it was a kigatsuku because I realized that it was my lack of humility that caused me to assume that their circumstances were the same as mine. And that's what led to my lack of empathy. And you know, I, I have to ask myself, was there some deep insecure part of myself that wanted to think that I was better than those parents? And is that why I was so unhumble? Maybe. Um, that experience made me ever so slightly less likely to make uncharitable assumptions in the future. Uh, I certainly still made them and still make them, but it, I learned something that day. All right, that's story one. Story number two. This one's about bare feet. So uh, I taught Aikido to some of our high school students at uh, People's Prep in Newark, as Shannon Sensei mentioned, and, and many of you had a chance to meet some of those students uh, when they came to a handful of uh, seminars. Um, so imagine for a minute me preparing for that very first Aikido class with students from People's Prep. Um, you could probably imagine that I was super excited, which I, I really was, and I had uh, put a lot of work into that first class. I had passed out flyers and put up posters to advertise, and I'd gotten waivers from parents, and I'd borrowed mats from the, the New York City dojo, and I'd cleaned out one of our biggest classrooms and like put all the desks to the side and cleaned the room well. And of course I planned the, the lesson itself really well or really carefully at least. And so the students arrive and I greet them at the door and I ask them to take off their shoes and socks and to join me on the mat. And at first they just sort of froze and kind of blinked at me. 
And they seemed shocked that I was asking them to take off their shoes and socks and embarrassed by the prospect. Well, it turns out that within their particular subculture, there was a taboo about showing your feet in public. And I didn't know that. I probably should have known that at this point, but I didn't. Um, and so I quickly realized that I needed to respect their key. I recognize their key, respect their key, and I pivot. Uh, and I put myself in their place because, of course, the shoes were completely beside the point of what I wanted to teach them that day, right? Do they need to be shoeless in order to learn about four basic principles? Of course not. Except that I didn't do that at all, and I completely blew it. I doubled down on my expectation about shoes and socks because I just was rigidly clinging to the instruction that I had given them. And I told them that it, it didn't matter. They shouldn't worry about having bare feet in public. But of course, the fact that it doesn't matter to me is entirely besides the point. It mattered to them. And the more inflexible I became, the more they squirmed and they started to like tease one another to try to get a sense of who was going to do it, you know, and are the cool kids going to do it? And if I had been more humble, I would have recognized that not everybody has the same cultural taboos. And for example, if I were in Japan, it would have seemed shocking and embarrassing to wear shoes inside at all. So I, of all people, should have been able to recognize the legitimacy of different attitudes about footwear. Uh, but I didn't. And if I had recognized their mind and respected it and put myself in their place, I would have been able to lead them from there anyway, right? Like, just like, and I just like, pretty much every Aikido technique. And I probably would have had them training without socks on in the near future anyway. But instead I'd lost some students that day. We were able to recover and I, you know, we had a, a vibrant club, but I probably could have brought more students or other students uh, to those seminars uh, where I, I was able to introduce them to you if, if I hadn't failed in that moment. All right, one more story. This one's about language. So when I first started teaching, I would hear my students speak in a dialect of English that was different from both the dialect of English that, I, that was spoken in my home growing up and also different from what linguists would call standard American vernacular English, which was like the dialect that I was speaking in the classroom. And I would correct their errors whenever I heard them. Uh, and I would have the students say or write the sentence the correct way each time. Because I did that because it was my job to teach them and it was a job that I took very seriously. Obviously, I still take very seriously. And so I you know, did it with boldness. And so if one of my students said or wrote the phrase or the sentence, she be passing by, I would say lovingly, she is passing by and have them correct it. But what I came to learn is that she be passing by does not mean the same thing as she is passing by. They were using what I now know that linguists call the habitual be, and it means that she passes by here on a regular basis, not that she was doing it right now. And you know, none of my students would ever have said, for example, oh, she be passing by tomorrow uh, at 5 p.m. or something like that, like that wouldn't have made any sense. So what I began to realize is that what I was perceiving as errors to be corrected were actually just differences and that it didn't make any sense to think of their language as wrong or inferior or as simplified or less sophisticated versions of English. In fact, I learned that particular features of the way they would speak, such as you know, omitted possessives or null copula and things like that, they were governed by clear and sometimes very complex rules. They were just rules that I didn't know. And they were features Many of them are features from linguistics influences from other languages or evolutions of language that stuck within a particular community, but they were not a degraded or bastardized version of English. And it would make as, about as much sense for me to say that French is correct and Japanese is incorrect as it would for me to say that my students' dialect was full of errors. Um, although French, maybe the French have sort of had that attitude historically, maybe. Uh, but now I, I still had a very important responsibility to teach my students standard American vernacular English, or as some people call it formal English or the language of power, because they need to know it in order to access opportunity in this country. 
But the way that I talk about it now is completely different. I, I can tell students that they need to practice the rules of the dialect uh, that I'm teaching them, not because they need to reject the language of their home, but because they need to be fluent in both so that they can code switch between them, right? And that, that you know, whatever would be appropriate. Um, and I teach them that there is nothing inauthentic about this kind of code switching. It's the same thing in principle that we do all the time, right? I don't talk to my kids the same way that I talk to my wife, and I don't talk to my wife the same way that I'm talking to you all right now. And that's natural. So I can tell my students, look, there are people out there who will judge you for saying she be passing by. It shouldn't be that way, but it is. And they might assume that you are poorly educated if you say that or if you write that. And in some cases, those people could be the gatekeepers to opportunity in your life. They could be reviewing your college application or your scholarship application or your job application. And I want you to have every advantage that you can get. So when I say code switch, understand me to be saying in this room that we will be practicing speaking and writing in a different dialect, not because it's inherently better, but because it's expedient. And that's what I'm, I, I say to them. And I think that this is just a much more respectful and empowering message than me telling them that everyone they love talks wrong. I don't think I ever explicitly thought that my way of talking was the only right way of talking, but if I had been more humble, I would have realized that that was the subtext of what I had been saying to my students. And if I had been more humble, I would have been able to know their mind and know their language and respect their language and put myself in their place and lead from there. And when I did put myself in their place, I came to absolutely love learning more about the way that they would speak. And I became a student of their dialect and eager to learn about you know, words and phrases that I didn't already know and talk about their, the etymologies with students and things like that. Um, quick shout out to uh, Dr. John McWhorter. Uh, he's a, linguistic professor, a linguistics professor at Columbia University. He's got a bunch of uh, fun books and a podcast called uh, Lexicon Valley. Uh, and it, that's taught me a lot about this and a, a lot about linguistics in general, and I'd recommend it to anybody who's interested in that kind of thing. Okay, so those are three of the million kigatsuku that have come from my million failures of humility. Uh, and those are just the million that I'm aware of, right? Like how many more millions um, have, have I not been aware of and do I still have to learn from? So, um, okay, so I wanna uh, take, uh, Another 45 seconds, this will be our final stop and jot. Uh, take 45 seconds to reflect on everything that I've talked about. Uh, okay, uh, and then after that, we'll uh, do some uh, questions and answers. Okay, so um, go ahead and start your 45 seconds now, please. Ten more seconds. Okay. So I hope that that um, I hope that in your reflection you were able to think about some ways that you, some practical ways that this might apply to your life. I I would hate for it to only live in the you know abstract realm. Um, and yeah, I hope that we we feel like we could apply it to our Shugyo, our daily life training. Um. Ben Sensei, thank you. There are a couple questions in the chat, which uh, I can read to you or you can browse. Um, it, it's always easier, I guess, for the person who wrote it. I know uh, Ileana Shainer Sensei had one. Yes, Patton Sensei, thank you. Um, my question was, how do you deal with yourself when you realize that you make an assumption or you hear yourself say a prejudice that you didn't hear yourself, you, you didn't know that you was part of your mind, but then you hear it for yourself. 
how do you not beat yourself up or what is your process then for expanding in that moment? Mm -hmm. Thank you. Thank you for that question. I think that that's, yeah, that's great. I, I think that, you know, I've, I've done it, uh, uh, the wrong way and ineffectively a bunch of times. Um, but I think that what I need to make sure is that I don't get defensive. Um, because that, that is where that's my temptation is right. Right. To, to get defensive and to say like, Oh, but that's not what I meant. And, and so, you know, you're, you're taking what I said in a different way than I intended it. Um, which again is really beside the point, right? Like I, I, regardless of my intentions, what I, what I said may have had some impact that may be separate from my intention. Um, right. Once you act or speak, right. <laughs> Your action or speech can never be fully erased. Um, and so, so what I should do, I think is when somebody brings this to my attention is I should say, I'm sorry. And thank you for teaching me. Um, and I think, you know, what I've found is that if I react more that way, that, that, um, the, the reaction that I get from a person bringing this to my attention is, is this, you know, fellow feeling it, you know, there's, even if what I've said is, is really offensive, it's like, oh, okay, well, you know, he's taking responsibility, he's, he's moving forward. And so, you know, without the defensiveness, it, it's just easier to get to forgiveness and learning. Um, and going back to, you know, Shanerson said, uh, read that, that session title of Growth Mindset. Um, if you're not familiar with uh, Dr. Carol Dweck's uh, writings about uh, growth and fixed mindsets, I recommend it. it uh, it certainly changed my life. And so I, I, I try to approach any type of feedback like that as, as neutral and instructive. Um, and, you know, I don't, I don't always succeed, but that's, that's the goal in, in those moments. Thank you very much. Thank you, Sensei. Um, Pat Sensei, the next question actually comes from me, if you don't mind. Um, Please. I love your statement about how differences are actually the thing that can make us feel more connected. But I think we also know that differences can lead to judgment. And judgment, obviously, is what causes problems. Is judgment simply a lack of humility? Or is, is, is it something more that we you know, need to distinguish what right and wrong? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I, yeah, I think that that's, I think that that's right. I think that judgment is, uh, it's, it's perceiving differences uh, without the humility. Um, whereas humility, you know, opens us up to perceiving more and also um, to responding differently to the differences that we perceive. Um, and I guess I think that the, the biggest, right, of course, you know, people have used difference uh, as justification for genocide. And so uh, it's, it certainly can be, you could pay attention to differences in, in horrible ways. Um, but I think that what I, I guess what I want to caution myself and, and others about in, in this particular talk is the temptation to think, to, to oversimplify or to say that like, oh, differences don't actually matter. Um, it's, you know, those, those differences are insignificant uh, or I don't perceive those differences. Because I think that that's unhelpful, right? Because for it may be really easy for you not to perceive some difference, uh, but some difference that a person has in a minority group might be, you know, they, they might not have the luxury to not be aware of that difference all the time. And so I think that it's, um, it lacks awareness to pretend like those differences don't exist or like they're insignificant. Thank you. Um, and I guess we have one more minute and also Adam Goldfarb has chimed in at the last three minutes with a insightful question. May not be a one minute long <laughs> can of worms, but, um, but since I, uh, today or some time, you know, you, you made this persuasive case in the distinction you drew between focusing on race and anti-racism versus pretending that the problems don't exist. And I'm just curious whether any of the distinctions that you spoke about today have like further influenced the way that you 
now dig deeper on the anti-racism side of that um, distinction. Um, yeah, I, I guess I will need to <laughs> try to answer that question. Like, that's a, an awesome question. Um, and so, yeah, I'll, I'll need to, we'll need to talk about that another time, but, um, but thank you for that. Let's do that. So that takes us to the top of the hour. Uh, Shane Sensei, oh, first of all, thank you, Pat and Sensei. I think you'll notice in the chat that this was very well received. Um, so let me hand it over to Shane Sensei to uh, close us down and perhaps a tease for future events. Yes, uh, I'd be happy to. Uh, Nathan, thank you so much. Uh, thank you for your preparation and your wisdom and your authenticity and telling wonderful stories on yourself uh, is a wonderful way for all of us to relate because we all, we, all, we all have our own uh, mm -hmm. stories like that. And I really appreciate it. And, and um, I just want to say, I, I've always admired you and your work. Um, and your work, it, it, I know, is in multiple spheres, including being a good husband and father. And you're just, you're incredible. Um, but anyway, thanks for being in my life. Thank you so much, Sensei. Um, this was not planned this way, but I think it's going to work out really cool. Uh, next week, we're going to hear from Josh Queen, Sensei. Um, and the title of his talk is going to be Noticing the Difference. I guess we have a theme here. How Key Training Complements Mental Health Counseling. And the teaser here will be as follows. Uh, Queen Sensei will discuss his career transition from banking to his current private practice as a mental health counselor. Specifically, he will share how key principles have influenced his mental health counseling practice in multiple clinical environments. The overlap is rather obvious here. Pat and Sensei has helped us to understand how do we learn to understand our partner's mind? Well, we have to extend key first, but we have to be radically humble to get out of our own way um, in order to build that depth of connection. And I know from you know, working with Queen Sensei and being with him since he's here in South Carolina, that the same thing in his clinical practice is how do I get to understand the mind of the person who is seeking my assistance? Um, he specializes in family counseling, uh, addiction, um, and uh, I, I think, I, think I, I wouldn't be surprised if he figures out ways to build off this uh, incredible presentation, Nathan, so thank you. I'm mindful that we're three minutes over. I want to respect your time because uh, I really honor the fact that you take an hour out of your week to be with us. And uh, again, I, I look at your faces and it motivates me and gets me all charged for the next. So I'm excited. Uh, Nathan, thank you again. Josh Queen, we'll be looking forward to your visit. He's actually counseling right now, so he's not on the call for me to turn it over to him for uh, some comments. Um, but let me just thank you all again. Uh, it's a pleasure and I love you all. Thank you.